Hello and welcome to Podcasting as Praxis. Uh, today is a special culture episode. We're talking about colonialism and imperialism in video games. And um, as a special guest, we've got Josh Sawyer, who's created um, many games that you're familiar with. Um, do you want to do a quick introduction of yourself, Josh? Sure, yeah. I'm the uh, studio design director at Obsidian Entertainment. And before that, I worked at Black Isle Studios. Um, I worked on the Icewind Dale games at Black Isle, and then at Obsidian, I worked on Neverwinter Nights 2, Fall at New Vegas, and Pillars of Eternity 1 and 2, and a project that has not been announced yet. Intriguing. And um, from the podcast tonight, we've got Ben. Hello. Rob. Hello. And one of the many Jameses. Hello. And uh, obviously, I'm Jamie. So... Um, to start start us off tonight, uh, we'll start off with an easy one. Why is there so much politics in videos game? <laughs> <laughs> uh, because everything is political. Yeah. There you go. Well, that that was an easy one. <clears throat> I mean, I think if you're doing, you know, a narrative game and you're interacting with a society or factions, then you have to sort of go into it, into how they're run and who's in charge and all that sort of stuff. And then it's a matter of, well, how does the game port? You know, you can easily make a game where the dominant society is a monarchy and it's just presented as the best thing ever, but that's not interesting and also really disingenuous. I think I think also the... Um... There's a, a line of thinking, and this, whether you're talking about games or you're just talking about people in, in everyday life, um, when people say that they're not political, what they usually mean is that the current status quo is like fine for them or good for them, and they don't think about it until someone talks about changing what that status quo is, and then they get really surly about it. And and they'll insist that they're apolitical, but really they just support the status quo. And in games, when things either tacitly or sort of explicitly support the status quo, in some ways they're seen as apolitical, which is nonsense, of course. But it's the same line of thinking where you say like, well, I don't think about this, therefore it's not really, um, it doesn't exist. Like that, that power structure doesn't really exist for me because I'm completely supported by it. Yeah, yeah. Like if a game's about if a game's about a straight white cishet male, um, you know, then it's not political. But when it's got women or minorities or um, queer people in, then it's political. Yeah, it's about and identity should, politics. Should, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You should take the, you should take the politics out and, and just do a normal game. Yeah, exactly. So I thought we we want to get started on um, a, a quick sort of discussion about um, the the four X games. Um, and specifically uh, four new X's that Rob came up with? Yeah. <laughs> I saw those. Sorry, I was, I was footling around. Um, I came across an essay um, from a uh, forum called Imperial Global um, Forum at Exeter University written by a guy from McGill University, and he identified sort of gaming in general. I mean, he specifically talks about civilization, uh, but he sort of that the big four themes uh, big sort of play styles in uh gaming are essentially the four x's so, um, exploration expansion exploitation and extermination now i think i mean most traditionally those are in the in the civilization games but i think they're all sort of those four axes at least to me seem quite as of an interesting angle in into gaming and especially if we talk about sort of colonialism and exploitation uh, and imperialism, because essentially they're sort of the the four station the the, the four stations of the the imperial of the colonial project essentially. Although you could put extermination somewhere in the middle uh, of any of them. Yeah. So so like when when you're talking about like games like Civilization, it's uh, um, the idea that anywhere you haven't explored yet is the untamed wild, and everyone who lives there is a barbarian, and they're just a sort of a problem to be dealt with. Yeah. Is that the sort of thing you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like the, the, the in in terms of the exploration, it's it's very traditional. It's you know it's 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 the um, the black map which you see not just in Civilization but also in in Pillars of Eternity or, or sort of pretty much anywhere where the, the, the exploration element is always to say 
you know, as you say, is to say, well, here's this place um, that nobody knows and we must now go into it. And then we have encounters and those encounters are with some notable exceptions and we will talk about Fiddles of Eternity, um, pretty much like you encounter things that are generally hostile to you and whose motivations in a lot of games that are very poorly written are very poorly explained. It's, you know, civilization has the civs, but it also has the barbarians. What are the barbarians? Why are the barbarians? That's not important. You know, they've got big red buttons on their heads and they want to kill you. Why do they want to kill you? Is unclear. Um, a lot, also a lot of like action games, you know, you encounter some kind of alien. Why is the alien? Who knows? It just needs to be shot in the head. I mean, to be, I mean, in Civ specifically, it's weird because you, all the Civs start off exactly the same as barbarians, right? You've got like your little tiny city, and you've got some uh, war units, and but but some civilizations will always grow and become civilizations, and the barbarians always stay barbarians and don't really go anywhere. They're just there to be dealt with, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, they never do. They never do. Never, never advance beyond just being a problem. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's something they they do sort of maybe lean towards addressing in some of the later saves where they have city states, which are sort of um, like barbarians plus. They'll never they'll never expand um, and become an actual civilization. But you know, their one city, you you can actually trade with it and make alliances and stuff. But the barbarians are still there at the same time, obviously. And, you know, yeah, but and it's all predetermined, right? Like, barbarians yeah, can't become a yeah. city-state, and citizens can't become a civilization. It's just, that's just the way it is. And civilizations can't be reduced to barbarism. And debatable, yeah. I guess. <laughs> well, mechanically, well, yeah, yeah anyway. mechanically. Um, I do think, like, it's a, it's a exacerbated problem. But, I mean, like, we, I will say that as game developers, we often do have the mentality of, like, like what like what can be here that you can sort of murder with no compunction and there yeah, are, that's yeah there are obviously like problems with that when you're dealing with just a single slice of time you know like well this takes place over a few days or whatever but i think that the implications of it especially since we're talking about colonialism are really exacerbated when you're looking at a long timeline and you ask like well why are all of these cultures considered to be civilizations and things that change and develop and advance, so to speak, and everything else exists in stasis until you wipe it off the map. Yeah, so um, sort of tied into that, I think, is um, the idea that uh, technology just is um, ever advancing, and you're either on the sort of technology train or you're not, you, you know what I mean? The, Barbarians and city states. Um, the city states will get better units, but you know they'll never go into space and they'll never sort of invent the United Nations or anything like that. The barbarians get better units in different time periods, but they never actually develop any technology. Um, you don't see them build roads and stuff. But the way technology is presented in a lot of games is that it's just uh, a sort of powerful force for good that just never goes backwards. It always just goes forward. The Steven Pinker approach. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Technology is never lost, it's never forgotten. Not like not like in real history where there's several prominent examples of that actually happening. You've got the Romans who built things out of a mixture of concrete that we still haven't quite managed to reproduce today. And when aliens came down and built the pyramids, obviously. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Don't get me started on that one, please. Well, and, then, and then you also <laughs> get things like, you know, especially... Um, the limited understanding that we have of Gaul, you know, like the way that Rome viewed Gaul and the way, you know, like a lot of our records come from fucking Caesar who, who had obviously extremely biased views of them, but also had like a lot of contempt for, well, basically just didn't consider them to be a real civilization at all. Um, even though like the Gauls had like the colony calendar shows that the Gauls had actually developed a much more precise calendar than the, um, the Julian calendar, but after the Gauls were effectively wiped out or conquered, um, that didn't stop the Romans from just continuing to use their calendar, which was quite flawed for another thousand years. Um, so it does it either ignores or obliviates the um, the technological advances of cultures that are are considered inferior. 
Yeah, and there's this, this whole interesting aspect as well, um, I think, in, in a lot of games, but because we were talking about civilization before, that, that the tech tree is not just ever advancing, that, that you must advance, because if you don't, you'll just simply be, be overtaken, which I think there is historical context to, to say that, that at least some of that is, is, is true. Um, but also that it's it's all the same. Um, you know, everybody invents pottery, everybody invents the wheel, everybody invents a calendar, everybody invents whatever, mounted horse or, or something. And there's very little to, to sort of say some things are unique or some things are um, different. And, and I think even we were talking before we started recording, we started talking a little bit about um, RTSs, which has sort of fallen out of favor. But if you think about something like like StarCraft, where even there they had this sort of idea that you know, from the small base, you build the big base and then you get the, the fancier flyers and whatever, um, that it's always a, a race upwards. Um, and it, I think apart from in the latest iteration of civilization, where they do introduce things like, like climate change and, and resource end, is there's very little sort of thematic of, but technology can also steer you horribly wrong. I mean, depending on, on, on you know, how you view something like animancy and Pillars of Eternity, I suppose, but you know, I find I always find that interesting that that technology is always just presented as something good. Um, you know, it's been a while since I played them, but um, you know, Age of Empires one and especially two did a lot to differentiate cultures by the tech trees that they had. Um, which isn't to say there was no overlap whatsoever, but there were certainly quite a few technologies that were, if not exclusive, certainly not every civilization had them, but they were always presented as purely beneficial. Um and purely like and it's all it's all in the context of of warfare and and conflict so that obviously biases things a lot um but but if if your only contrast between cultures is yeah i wouldn't even say it's military technology but like even the stuff that's not like wheelbarrow i remember wheelbarrow is like a, a tech upgrade in age of empires and not everybody gets it um but the reason why you want wheelbarrow is to help your villagers move faster so that you can get more materials to create engines of war, basically. <laughs> so it's, it's all, it's all in that sort of conquest uh, context. So even the stuff that does have some nuance and, and, and contrast between it all essentially gets melted down into combat efficacy. I mean, you can make the point that, you know, these are, especially stuff like age of, um, age of empires, um, you know, these are these are war games. Of course, of course. Civilization at least has pretenses of oh, you can win via culture or Abs science. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the the thing with the thing with Civ, um, you you don't have to, you know, the I mean, the classic Civ victory is you uh, you colonize the stars, isn't it? It's, you head off to you send a ship off to Alpha Centauri, but the, there's there's a a bunch of um, there's a bunch of like sort of non of more peaceful victories, but they all they all do involve like some sort of like domination aspect. Like even when there's the I think Civ Five, I don't I don't know if it was in six, but Civ Five had a thing where you could um win a diplomacy victory. Yeah, even, there was a UN that, sort of thing. Yeah, even that involved you being like elected world leader. It you know what I mean? It wasn't that you brought everyone together, it was that you like put yourself on top of everyone in just a, a different context um and you know it, it would be interesting to see i think a game like that where you could where playing to to achieve a draw was like a a goal in itself you know like you everyone else is trying to win by going into space or killing each other or becoming the dominant culture and you can sort of make the effort to try and just bring everyone together and settle, have them settle for a draw and, and live together in, in peace. And that's not really an option because it, it's seen as, or it would be seen as sort of anti-game. Yeah. If, if you see yeah, what yeah. I mean. And it, it's, a, it's a similar thing to, you get a lot of games where um, you can play as a pacifist and go through the whole game without like killing anyone. And there's there's some exceptions to that where you can play the game as a pacifist, except, and then you, there's a list of boss fights where you have to kill the boss. <laughs> and specifically, like the re the reason you can't like just tase the boss like you can everyone else is because that would be too that would be too cheap. It would it would cheat you out of the you know what I mean. There's a there's a fight here, 
with a guy that has a rocket launcher for a hand or something. <laughs> and if you could just if you could just shoot him with a taser and then call it a day, well then you know what I mean. You 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 skipped content and that's not allowed. So you can do the game. I'm 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 thinking specifically of Deus Ex Human Revolution here. Um, you can do that game completely as a pacifist, but you have to kill the three bosses because that. You know what I mean? It would be cheating to to get past them I think, without. Yeah, I think there's also a narrative sort of like aspect to that where they um, I and I uh, obviously I don't have any special insights to that that team, but what I would first think of is that the story, I would consider this a good thing, but the story would change obviously if you don't kill someone. And obviously at Obsidian we try to always say like, well, what if you don't kill this person, or what if you what if you do kill this person? There's different ways to play it out. Um, in Deadfire, I would say that we actually did, we planned to have a compromise. Um, oh, the, this might be spoiling some stuff for people, but like there is a faction choice that you have to make in the late game. And uh, we actually tried to plan out a, um, we'll all go in together. So there's one where you can forsake everyone. You can say like, I don't like any of these factions, which many people said, um, I don't like any of these factions. I'm going to go alone. But we also had one where you could say, like, I want to try to unify everybody to get them to stop fighting. And for us, it was actually, it wasn't a matter of, of skipping or saying, no, you got to make the hard choice. It was just too hard for us to logistically do it. Like, there were too many, um, too many story states, um, which I guess to make this uh, back to a more, like, important, like, player-facing thing, from the player's perspective... They don't know that it was hard. It just seems like they don't have an option that feels like it should exist. And because it doesn't exist, it reinforces this idea of you must support one victor over everyone else. Yeah. I mean, this is kind of the... I, I still haven't finished uh, Deadfire, so this is like the exact point where I am in the game. Nice. Um, and I will say I'm finding it genuinely hard to... to pick at least one of them. I know there's an option where you can sort of go at it alone and leave them to it, but I've decided that, you know, I'm somewhat of an adult now and then sometimes it is important to <laughs> to, to make a, a a choice yeah but what i wanted to get in, get back into because of the the sort of the imperialism colonialism theme of the episode is is what i really like in in dead fire which is this for people who have played it it's this sort of um blend of polynesia caribbean uh with a lot of colonial with at least two colonial factions um in it maybe three depending on how you look at it and one sort of native tribe is that would that be a correct correct way of, of putting it uh, yeah that, i mean that's yeah that's fair that's fairly accurate i mean like you could i mean some of the some of the juana who are the the broad native culture will actually say that the kahanga is the dominant tribe but that the kahanga do not actually represent the interests of the individual myriad tribes of the archipelago. Um, but like, but yeah, that, that's, that was a thing where I was like, no, we, we shouldn't have one colonial culture. Let's do all the extra work to have two colonial cultures. Um, specifically because I was like, I want, like it's so often in our own world where it's not just that one colonial imperial power arrives. It's that two or three arrive and then they play off of each other and they and the na and they try to play the natives off of each other or the other colonial group um and i thought that that dynamic which exists so often in our own world would be interesting to explore and very hard but <laughs> but we tried so i think deadfire did quite a good job of that because in each faction you will all you will have people who are like very obviously doing this for reasons that they think are good and some people who just, you know, flat out don't care about the natives. Uh, and even in the smaller, like the non-main uh, story beats, you've got options if you want to... Uh, just off the top of my head, in uh, Sayuka, um, you know, you, you basically show up on an island and someone goes, there's a bunch of druids here who are attacking our new settlement, go deal with them. And you can choose to, you know, you can choose to go with the one of the colonizer... Uh, nations and just root them out and hand them the island. You can, and this is granted quite hard to do, but you can side with the druids yeah. and have everybody be mad at you. Yep. <laughs> and you know, most games don't don't give you that option. It's just the, these things are in the way. Please do this quest and collect ten druid asses for me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah one thing that Deadfire did do that I was very impressed with was it didn't do the all 
there's a good choice, there's an evil choice, and there's a neutral choice routine that a lot of RPGs sit, tend to do these days. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely a lot of nuance involved in, in most of the choices, if not all of them, um, which is which is really good, I think. Thanks. Um, to, to jump off the back of something you said there about wanting to represent more than one colonial power, um, that brings to mind a very specific example, which um, I'm not sure if people are familiar with, which is Sid Meier's colonization from no, uh, the... I'm not early 90s I played it but i was i played it a very small one it's been a long time ago it was um i mean it was it was basically like a sort of a more focused offshoot of, of civ um so it's there's there's four colonial powers there's the english the french the spanish and the dutch and you arrive in in the new world which is either america or a random map and there are several native tribes on uh, the land, on the continent already. And um, you sort of, you come there and you have to found America. And so it's, you, you, you move units around, found cities, um, that sort of, same sort of thing as Civ. But then you've got um, much more specific, like it's much more sort of granular. Like instead of just a worker, every colonist has a job that you, you can put them in and certain people are, are better at other jobs. And that was, I mean, it was it was quite a popular game at the time, I, I think. I mean, it was, quite, it was certainly popular with everyone I knew at college. But it, it was, looking back at it, it was genuinely, like, kind of horrendous in how it rep- <laughs> how it just whitewashed the, um, the settling of America. So there's no representation of slavery. Um, you do get indentured servitude. Um, in that sometimes, because the way you recruit people is like immigrants show up on the docks of Europe and sometimes they'll be indentured servants um, and they have a slight penalty to their production, which goes away after a, after they've worked a certain amount of time. <laughs> as, 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 as workers are <laughs> want to do, they do get happier over time. <laughs> <laughs> you get criminals... Um, who have even worse things, and I can't remember if they, I think they eventually like can get better at stuff. But um, and you can get native workers if you send missionaries into the villages. After a certain amount of time, they'll send a uh, like a member of the village to, to live with you. They they're better at outdoor jobs. They can't do anything that involves sort of working indoors because that's <laughs> skilled labour. So they're better in the, in the fields. Yeah. It, it's, it's pretty bad and it's um and you get like um you get different founding fathers for your continental congress and they're all based on like historical figures but some of the bonuses they give you are just sort of like horrendous so there's there's um i think it was peter stuversant if you get him then you no longer have to like the, the pay the natives to, to take their land from them. Um, Jesus. If you get Pocahontas, it just resets. Because obviously, the, if, the, the more of a dick you are, the more aggressive the, the natives get. But if you, if you recruit Pocahontas, they just forgive all your sins. Oh, nice. Yeah. It was, it was <laughs> so nice like, like I say, it was... Do they, do they sing a song and make like friends with a raccoon or something? Or? <laughs> I mean, quite possibly, yeah. be a bit difficult it's... to represent that in the, uh, in the sound blast at Euro, but... <laughs> It's just weird that people like the the you make that people make games where like yes colonization is in fact a good and wonderful thing that we did and especially when you add actual historical figures to it then you are you know whitewashing very specific things as well yeah yeah and I mean it, the the closest it gets to addressing the the sort of history of of American colonization in or the negative aspects of it is that. The, like each each power you can play as has a bonus. Um, so like the French are, I think the French annoy the natives at a, at a slower rate than everyone else because they're supposed to be more diplomatic. The Dutch are better at trade. The English are just uh, rowdy dickheads. I think they're better, <laughs> better at, at like, violence or something. Um, but the Spanish one is you get like combat bonuses when you're attacking native cities and they always give you like more gold when you sack them. So the Spanish, like, if you play as the Spanish, the, the, the intended way to play is to just, like, ransack it's, the entire continent. It's to be the conquistadors, and, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I was just going to say, there's a parallel, actually, in Age of Empires 2, that even even when, when Age of Kings came out, 
back in the 90s, I was kind of like, yikes, which is um, Spanish. Um, their two unique units are conquistadors and mounted missionaries. And when I played the conquistadors, they're, they're mounted um, gun units. And I was like, these guys are not that good. I was like, God, these guys don't seem that good. Like, what are they good for? And then I ran them into an area with um, civilians and they just one shot at every civilian. And I was like, wow, holy shit. <laughs> and then, and then their, um, their unique tech upgrade is literally called supremacy. And it makes their villagers like um, much stronger against other villagers. So you can literally just rush your villagers into an enemy base and just beat the shit out of all their villagers and kill them. And I'm like, that is really on the fucking nose, dude. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a bit much. I mean, like I say, I remember, I remember civilization being like, at least, um, obviously it was pre widespread internet. So it's a bit harder to tell, but it was, it was certainly popular with everyone I knew in college and university. Um, and they did a, they did a re-release of it in, 2006 uh, wasn't it somewhere around then and i assume it just it 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 just hit differently you know what i mean like with 13 years in 13 years intervening i sort of like played it in 2006 and just thought oh wow this this is really this is really bad isn't it you know what i mean like once i'm, I'm no longer a sort of like uh a teenage dipshit and i'm looking at it and i'm thinking yeah this is quite bad and i, I seem to recall it didn't do very well at all the relaunch um, but this definitely. Yeah, but this will bring up sort of an interesting point, uh, also I think for for Josh, which is that it does change over time. Like, could you? I mean, I think you could make something like Deadfire um, five years, ten years, fifteen years ago. But I do wonder what, like, what, the, how much sort of gaming in an, in as an industry also sort of responds to these um, political trends. I mean. Famous, I just I briefly thought of Duke Nukem Forever, which was a car crash for for so many reasons. But I think one of the reasons was it was I played it when when I was a little one, and then you know the whole stripper business was kind of fun. But I think maybe the even even gaming culture had sort of gone a little bit to the point of like this seems a bit crass and much, or is it just is that just my my mistake? No, I, I do think that there's like even I have even I have misstepped. Like I I look back at um like Honest Hearts was the expansion that or the DLC that I directed for Fall of New Vegas, and it deals with um basically Mormon missionaries interacting with tribes in Utah, and these were not these were not like Native American tribes. These were new tribes that had formed after the bombs fell. Um, and a lot of the inspiration for it, I took from a film that I loved, Lawrence of Arabia and the Mission. But the problem is that Lawrence of Arabia and the Mission do not really feature native voices that much. It is about the struggles of colonizers to reconcile themselves with what they're doing to the native people, but the native people don't actually like get much of a like they they feel like they're just being moved around by the the protagonists um who are not native um and like at the time that I made it I was like I did a good job on this and looking back at it there are certain things that I think were a good job and then there are other things where I'm like ah, I shouldn't have done that or I wouldn't do that that way again um and so I do think that it's a general there's a general uh do you want to call it a, a Weltgeist? <laughs> like, there's there's a change of opinion, I think, generally. And also, I think individually, um, you know, we all grow. And like you said, whether it's as consumers looking at things, again, with fresh eyes, or as de game developers hearing criticisms and then going back and looking at your work seriously and going like, you know what? I, I can do better than this in the future, and I, I'm going to try to do better than this in the future. I mean, on the other hand, we still have the Call of Duty series, which just seems to be relishing in, you know, you are the big strong male operator and, you know, everything else must die and, <laughs> and cease to be, which is a... I mean, they've gone further than that. Like, it's straight up. I mean, did you did you see the whole Highway of Death thing? I, I haven't. I, I stopped playing them a long while ago. I've not played them either, but uh, recently, but I've read about it. And essentially, Highway of Death was 
an actual thing that happened. Oh, yeah. It's a road between Iraq and Kuwait, and the U.S. just, like, apparently killed a ton of civilians on it. And it's presented in one of the uh, more recent Call of Duties, basically exactly the same, except the Russians did it, except and not the Americans. What? <laughs> <laughs> like that, that's it. No, I'm pretty sure we did that. That. <laughs> that is that is pretty incredible, really. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And let's not talk about Oliver North making an appearance in. Um, oh Jesus Christ! <laughs> Call of Duty. Now there's a name from the past if you're not familiar with him. Yeah. Involved in the Iran Contra oh, yeah. affair where he was uh, trading trading arms for terrorists. Oh yeah. Sorry, trading arms to terrorists for hostages. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah, I lived through all that garbage, and so like, I, I honestly like the, f I mean, I couldn't believe when I was young, and and he sort of like more or less, more or less got away with it without much harm, and I was like, wow, that's incredible, and then to see him come back as like a commentator and like guy in a fucking video game, I'm like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> like, <laughs> this is Oliver North. What the fuck is he doing here? Um, I mean, that's, but that raises an interesting question, Josh. Do you think it's possible that, like, in, I don't know, 10 years, 20 years' time, um, that Call of Duty 400-2079 is going to be set during, like, the second Iraq War as, like, a, you know, good liberative project? Oh, of course. I, like, I, of course, just because, like, I've seen some, so my, my degree is in history and, and, like, the way that, the way that people over time, like, change their views on things, I shouldn't say people, there's, there's obviously individual people and then there's society as, as large, like, there was, um, you can find it if you do a search for it, but there's this fascinating graph that charts, um, French opinion, so this is French people's opinions on who was most responsible for defeating the Nazis. Oh yes, I know the one you mean. Yes. And and like and it's like 1945 and it's like Soviet Union and then and then like over time it becomes like USA, USA. And it just it, the way that it changes over time is so amazing to me. Um don't worry the UK is in there as well. But um <laughs> but it really like shifts in pull it shifts in pull from this massive like oh yeah, the Soviet Union, they were the fucking dudes, like, holy shit. Over to, like, yeah, it was definitely the United States. They're most responsible for it. And so I can very much see, I mean, obviously we look at we look at Call of Duty games, we look at any any World War II game. Um, I think Vietnam usually is, usually is a little more nuanced, but, like, you know, we see so much, so much media that will recontextualize these things or refocus them in, in, a, in a way that really tries to make them into very simple black and white um good versus bad sort of scenarios yeah and, and media does have a duty you know media and, and art like if you're portraying historical things or even not historical things but you're just talking about things like age of empires and the conquistadors or whatever like i guess you could argue that that's sort of Correct. commentary on yeah. how awful the Spanish were. <laughs> yeah. But I personally don't buy that. Yeah, it's it's a it's a, it's like is this an endorsement or is this illustrative or both? Yeah, I, I do think it's hard, especially when the, the, the again the, the player facing, the consumer, they don't know your intent. They just know what they're experiencing. And there's a lot of stuff I know from experience. There's a lot of times where people will come to me and I was like, I really loved how you portrayed this as this. And I'm like, gee, holy shit. That was not, that was not my intention. <laughs> like, wow, I can't believe that you took that out of there. Maybe I need to take another look at how I, how I represented that. Um, but yeah, sometimes things are seen as endorsements or endorsements either of a specific action or event or endorsements of a general trend. Like colonialism is good generally. Um, and that's rough stuff. Yeah, I think um, it sort of comes around to that. Um, there was a tweet someone, I, I want to say it was maybe Jack Saint made last week, where he, he tweeted out that we, in the wake of like the all the, the sort of uproar about Last of Us Part 2, I think, he tweeted out that um, maybe we just couldn't trust gamers with morally grey anti-heroes anymore. Because they always just take them as like they always read them as um, admirable heroes, uh... and then some someone had immediately replied to him and like missed the point completely. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> Somebody missed the point on Twitter. How do you what? <laughs> I bet it's not as just well. 
it's not just gamers though, right? Like you've got people idolizing Walter White and Rick Sanchez and all that sort of thing, and these are very obviously people who are not to be admired. Yeah, there's ton there's like you know, any of the characters in fucking a million Quentin Tarantino movies or you know, Fight Club or whatever, and like idolizing these characters that are clearly like not really supposed to be idolized. Um I do think it's a general it's it's a it's a tricky thing to deal with, um, because you, anti-heroes are interesting characters, but you get people that really wholeheartedly are like, no, they're fucking cool as shit, and I'm gonna I want to emulate them. Um, but yeah, I do think that's a media problem more broadly. I do think there's a slight difference in video games because you are controlling often. Sometimes you're interacting with them, which is a little more interactive. But in the cases where you're directly controlling the anti-hero, there's a much greater risk of direct association with that character and the actions that they undertake because you're you're performing them. Yeah, yeah, you, you sort of displace part of yourself um, into it. Talking about the sort of imperialism and colonialism aspect, whether or not it, it, it depends on scale um, as well. I mean, as, as we were talking about civilization and colonialism, uh, the, the Sid Meier's games and, and the others, is that always seems very distant and abstract. I mean, the cities, yes, you do build them up, but they're like a tile on a map, and army units are sort of little representative icons. So maybe in that scenario, it's a bit easier to do stuff like represent slavery or represent, um, you know, empire and, and colonization as essentially a good sort of progressive thing because we bring all the technology. But that that does that, do you think that becomes harder than the more sort of personalized it becomes uh, again like you know P pillars of eternity um, the, especially dead fire is much more intimate i mean it's you and a small party and then something like a first person shooter which has its own limits is even more intimate so d does sort of distance make it easier to do sort of grand scale atrocities vampire and just dress it up nicely oh absolutely i mean i think i think that applies to human beings in general, I mean, even step away from games, like, I think the more removed you are from the direct on-the-ground impact of the things that you're doing, the easier it is for you, generally speaking, to undertake <laughs> atrocious things, um, especially at scale. I think it becomes so impersonal. Um, but I do, th I do think that once you're dealing with individual characters that you follow over a period of time, and you see, like, one of the things in Deadfire, you can meet a... Um, you can go to the Valian Embassy. So the the Valian Republics are a one of the colonial powers for those who have not played, and they are very they're very sort of mercantile oriented. They're less interested in cultural um, erasure. They're Venetians, I think. Is, is that yeah. Good? yeah, essentially, yeah. Like they're 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 really they're they're just they're just in it for the the money and the resources. And they're like, you can keep your culture, but like we're gonna take all the stuff, basically. Um, and you can meet this young man who is there on behalf of his village, um, that basically got swindled, um, because they didn't really understand the, con like the contracts that they were agreeing to and signing. Um, and so it's just, you know, like language barrier and, j and also just cultural unfamiliarity with the idea of like, oh, this, this whole island is now going to be yours um which of course you see in tons and tons of colonial like things in real life um and when you directly talk to this individual guy you can see that he's a very um good-natured guy who really literally just does not understand like he does not have the cultural framework that the valians do they're they're completely they're basically talking completely different languages not just in the sense of actual languages but concepts where he's like i don't this doesn't make any sense. How can this island be theirs? Like, I don't, what? Um, and so I think that a lot of people, when they, when you get down to the individual characters and the individual conflicts, it's much, much harder to just kind of brush it aside and say like, well, that's progress. And there, ha there have been games that, I mean, I, I really like that quest in Deadfire specifically because of, you have to go talk to him and then you have, go, have to go talk to the Valiant guy separately. They're never in the same place together, and he'll like give you another piece of information. And then you go back and go, "What the fuck? You for you forged a, a, a contract or yeah. whatever?" And it's sort of a back and forth. Yeah. Um, but I, there are games that have handled like this specific 
issue as the theme of the whole game, and they are very generally regarded as pretty good games. You know, you've got uh, Undertale, you've got uh, Spec, so- Spec Ops The Line, which do a really good job of that sort of, of you know, this is what you, the player, have done. Papers, and please, maybe? Yeah, I think Papers, please is quite good at that as well, actually, you're right. Um, and yeah, it is about personal connection. You know, you've got even outside of gaming, you've, you know, you've got drone operators. Yes, very much so. Yeah, you mentioned um, you mentioned papers, please there, and um, and this is, I mean, this is going back to the the very first things we said in, in this episode. But um, there was a a sort of papers, please clone that was made, um, where you're a bouncer. Uh, not tonight, I think it's called. Yes, that might be it. Yeah, you're a bouncer at a like various clubs in a post Brexit Britain, <laughs> and you have to decide who's al- who's allowed in and who isn't. And um, there was a huge row on the Steam forums for that game because one guy like just barreled in, demanding the devs tell him if the game was political or not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that's just wonderful, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was it was incredible to see. It was like, I mean, what what at that point, what what is your definition of politics? If if you, if you're not clear on whether that game is political <laughs> or not, yeah, and I uh, I, I think that um, I think you know, like something with Deadfire, I think there's always a um, more to use an overused term, although maybe it's gone out of favor now. Ludo narrative dissonance. Um, because Deadfire, I mean, and I always, I, I understand that I'm, I'm part of the problem here, but like in Deadfire, you're a group of murderers that have a bunch of stats related to killing things, but then, but then also, and like you spend a lot of your time like micromanaging all these numbers and you get, um, you know, you get embroiled in uh, the story, which feels very, you know, lunar narratively disconnected from the mechanics of the core gameplay. Um, I think, you know, something like, uh, not to, not tonight. Is that what you said it was? Yeah. Yeah. Or, it's not tonight. Or, yeah. Or like papers, please. I know, I know there are some critiques of papers, please. Like I know Miriam Dushgalvita wrote like a, a big thing against it, but I do feel that one thing that papers, please does succeed at is the, there's great lunar narrative consonants. Like you are directly involved in these things. And the choices, I think what's very interesting, and it feels more, it feels really more of a materialistic scenario, is that at the end of every day, there are consequences for you. Um, and so it's not about purely being moral in the abstract. It is very directly connected to your own well-being and the well-being of your family. And if you choose to never accept a bribe and never do any of those things or go slowly or whatever, um, you will you will just as easily lose the game <laughs> as if you um, get caught for doing things you're not supposed to do. Which I thought I thought I think the more connected those things are, much like in spe- obviously Spec Ops Line is very differently, but you are directly involved in perpetu- you know like doing these actions and perpetuating um, what's happening. Yeah, yeah. A lot of RPGs, um, a lot of RPGs are sort of. Um, held up as having these like oh they've got these difficult moral choices but a lot of them it's like um, do I kick oh, the, the or- puppy or do I not kick yeah. the puppy yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, or- the orphanage is burned down do you kill the orphans or give them your house you yeah know what I mean that sort of thing and even if no, no matter what, like there's there's no sort of drawback at all which, whichever way you go like do you know what I mean you either you, you just go through because a lot of the time they'll be like a sort of they maybe have a morality system and you just you want to maximize your, your bad guy points to get the force lightning, or you want to maximize your good guy points to be able to like uh, I don't know, unlock a hat. Yeah, <laughs> do, but, do um, mass resurrection and but, give everybody fish. Yeah, but but whatever whatever choices you make, it doesn't impact you as a player because you're you're the the sort of you're the the hero of the narrative, and so you know maybe maybe you don't get access to a certain. Uh, like quest or a certain item if you make a certain choice but it doesn't it, it rarely sort of makes the game like it rarely imposes like noticeable penalties on you like you say with papers please where it's like you know you, you see your family going hungry at the end of the day 
but that that doesn't happen in an RPG because you're like you're the hero and, and you can just carry on. You know what I mean? You're impervious to to consequences. So whether you want whether you want to be good or bad is just very abstract in a lot of games because it's it's something people will do, um, and you know they'll they'll do one playthrough where they just maximize all the good choices and one playthrough where they maximize all the bad choices be, because that's the two ways to play the game, and it's 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 better I feel when there's a lot of sort of nuance to it and a lot of different ways you can approach things rather than just a a straight well, I kill everyone, or, or I just give everyone, like, you know, everyone gets a car, Oprah Winfrey style. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think I think that goes into something that, um, you know, like, in the in the prep for this was kind of mentioned, which was talking about um, avoiding, like, noble noble native or no, noble savage stereotypes. Yeah. Um, something that actually a lot of people did not like about Dead Fire is that they really just didn't like any of the of the factions. Like, not that they didn't think they were characterized well, but that they're like, they all are really flawed significantly, um, both broadly and in individual, like, power players. So even the native culture, the Juana, um, the ruling tribe is the Kahanga, but they clearly kind of took power rather than were granted power by the other tribes. And the queen and the prince, her brother... Um, they're really oblivious to a lot of the suffering of their people. Well, they, I mean, there's, there's, there's the literal sort of the, the lower c class people yeah. who live in a sun, sunless cleft in the mountain where there's literally like a mountain of garbage for them to, to, to root through. <laughs> exactly. And, and there, and there is a caste system and the caste system, I feel that we did a pretty good job of showing that the caste system works pretty well in, um, uh, meaning, like, most of the people are fairly happy in it in, like, small-scale societies, but that once you reach the size of a city like Nakataka, um, it completely breaks down. Um, and one of the things that I found that was incredibly wild was, um, like, how much, how quickly players who do, who identify as either they don't identify as right wing or don't identify as particularly imperialistic will very quickly justify supporting either the Royal Deadfire Company or the Valian Trading Company because the native culture is just so backward. And I was like, cool justification of Raj India. Like they, <laughs> yeah. like they, they don't, they don't really even realize that they're using the exact same, you know, it's like all the arguments about Sati in, in India when, uh, in, you know, the UK was, uh, sort of either administrating it or, or conquering it. Um, you know, it's like, well, these guys really have problems and we just need to straighten them out. Don't you think this is for the good of everyone? And It's our um, custom to, ha to hang men who burn women. Exactly, exactly. That's yeah. the, cl the classic quote. Um, and people very, players very easily slipped right into that. Like the second that the Juana showed any sort of flaws or any sort of things that they felt were culturally regressive or not liberal with enormous quotes around it. Um, they're like, well, I mean, what can you do? Like, somebody's got to take charge yeah. here. And I was like, holy shit. Like, I knew some people would do that, but I was really shocked with the ease with which people were able to justify that. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen people justifying it on forums as well, where it's like, oh, but, you know, well, yeah, the, so the the um, the Rawatai, uh, like, you know, they're conquerors, but at least they build them nice houses. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, and that's, and that's so, someone was talking about Sayuka before, and you can see those those quote nice houses in Sayuka. Yeah, yeah, you produce it in the game. I was really amazed by that that you actually produce this this, and I'm sure there's a historical analogy uh, that I'm failing to pick up right now, but where you where they've literally forced all the castes to live together in the same uh, hut, and it, it doesn't you know some of it appears to be going well, and some of it appears to be going very poorly, which I thought was was very well done. Thank you. Yeah, but I mean, that was a very, like, one of the things, like, we almost didn't do Sayuka, and I was like, we really, I said, it's very important that we show an example of Juana living in a, a Rautayan colony, so that you can see what it actually is going to be like. Um, whether you consider that good or bad, but clearly one of the consequences is that the Rautai do not care how the Juana used to live. They're like, well, you're going to live how Rawatayans live. So you're all going to live in houses like this, and you're going to live together, and we don't care about your caste differentiations or anything else. 
um and it really rubbed them the uh, like badly so um those those sort of structural you know like get all Foucault here you know like these you know like structural impositions of of power um I felt were very important to show yeah. but a lot of people just they miss it they're like well it's a nice house I think <laughs> who well, has a <laughs> who has a problem with this looks pretty good to me we built all those railways railways in Africa, so what, yeah. what have they got to complain about? Exactly. I mean, there's, exactly. there's direct sort of rel- uh, relations there between um, that and, and the, the Dawes Act um, in the U.S., where they literally said uh, that the purpose of the, the white man is to civilize the, the red man, and, and in order to be civilized, um, the, the red man should wear civilized clothes, cultivate the ground, live in houses, uh, ride cars, send their children to school, drink whiskey, and own property. So it's it's really that kind of an enforced modernization that we were talking to. That that sort of to go back to the earlier discussion in, in civilization that people just sort of assume no, no, this is fine. You know, everybody advances, everybody gets a car and gets to drink whiskey, which in case of the Native Americans certainly has never caused any problems afterwards. Ever. Yeah. <laughs> what I find bizarre is that. Yeah. there's this whole, you know, technology is advancing, but it's always, weirdly, the, the conquerors, you know, like, the Incas had their own, like, they didn't use, they didn't really write, um, they had, like, a system with strings and the, knots and stuff. The Quipa, I think and, it was called, but I might be mispronouncing that. Uh, yeah, and, like, we go, no, 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 you, you, re- you really need to, you know, use numbers and pencils and paper and stuff, and technologies that are not backwards, just parallel and different, and they're just like, no, no, this is this is not what civilization is. Yeah, and and language, of course. Yeah. To to mention like technologies in Civ, one thing um, of note in Civ is that um, you generally you get gunpowder, sort of um, gunpowder, sort of like in the game, if you get it. When Europe got it, like they, they had, they knew about gunpowder much earlier in other parts of the world. But that's just that's just not on the table as far as Sid's concerned. It was it was discovered when when like you know Europe got it. Everywhere else, like people people in the rest of the world weren't using it for guns, so it was just, it was invalid. Like it wasn't. Yeah, or or like movable type printing press, which was more. I wouldn't say more, but like the ubiquity of paper had as much to do with it taking off in Europe as like, yeah, I mean, cause like Korea, I think figured it out like much earlier, but they're like, God damn, like who's going to go through all this paper? Like, like this is, this is expensive. <laughs> like, and they were just like, this is impractical. Like, yeah, we can make movable type, but, but we don't really have the, the writing strata to, to like print stuff on or not that they didn't have it, but it was just it. Like, in Europe, if they had to do it on parchment, they still wouldn't have used it because parchment took forever to make compared to paper. Um, so it was really about, like, the combination of movable type, which, again, had been invented centuries earlier halfway around the world, with cheap paper. And that's what did it. But from from many people's perspectives, um, the, you know, the technology of movable type, which is really not complicated at all, um, oh, that, that, happens, that happens in the world in 1450. In Germany, that's it. Okay, sure. <laughs> like move, move on a little bit, and like sort of maybe ask a different type of question. Is like, which I also always find interesting, is this interaction between um, all games? You know, have a commercial imperative. They, or at least, I th- apart from like I don't know, a handful, of, handful of indies, but I think most of anything that that gets put out with some kind of budget to it has a has a commercial imperative how much operating space is there um well i mean if you're not funded by kickstarter of course um but i think even within that space like how much room for the is there for these kind of i wouldn't call them minority perspectives but i wouldn't also wouldn't necessarily call them majority perspectives like how far can you push nuance would you say how yeah how much how much nuance can you create how much sort of minority perspectives uh can you show before you know, sort of the 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 the, the sixteen year old spotty teenager just just turns it off and says, "I'm going to buy Call of Duty instead." You know, like how far can you push it? Yeah, I think I don't know personally. I would say there's there's obviously there's text and subtext, and 
you can do things that are textually fairly, let's say, inoffensive or uncomplicated. Um, and then subtextually, you can have a lot that is more sort of probing and inquisitive and thoughtful and nuanced. Um, I do think that's a very, very difficult line to walk. And I would, I would say that most, like I remember, oh my God, I got into this stupid, not really an argument, but like, um, you know, people were talking about the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And I was like, guys, th these things are not really thematically deep. Like, come on. No. They're like, uh, uh, no, they are. This deals with this and that. I'm like, well, they deal with it in big quotes by like referencing it, but they don't go into any depth of it. And it's entertaining. And you can kind of say like, okay, like we talk about, you know, like, like, yes, Black Panther deals with colonialism, kind of. Um, but that's also like, that's the mass, mass, mass worldwide market. And I do think that when, if you start to make the nuance, the focus, then your audience, um, let me just say that regardless of theme, I think that when you start to get into nuance, you're going to lose a big chunk of the audience because they just aren't interested in nuance, period. Like it doesn't really matter what the subject is. They're just not that interested in it. So I do think that if you want to sort of dive deep on that stuff and make it the focus, then yeah, you're probably looking at a smaller audience. Um, but that said, like, that's okay. <laughs> like, Jesus. I mean, like, we can have games like Night in the Woods and we can have like all these like very small games that find audiences and and make a huge impact with a big chunk of players or a big enough chunk of players, I guess, like big enough to have a lasting impact and be profitable, but it's not going to be Call of Duty. Like Night in the Woods Call of Duty edition is not going to be like a thing. So, And I think it's, I think regardless of, of um, how widespread a success it's, it's going to be, it, it's definitely worth pursuing uh, art of that type. Because, yes. Um, no, don't get me wrong. I wasn't suggesting there was. No, no, no. I wasn't. I wasn't. I'm not suggesting that you were. You were saying you know shouldn't be done unless it's going to make a million. But um, I was going to. I was just going to bring up that um, I can think of at least one instance where the uh, the inverse is true when someone set out to make a game specifically. Um, you know, I can't remember what it's called. It's that medieval uh, Skyrim thing where the you know, it was expressly, oh, it's not political, it's just historically accurate. So everyone... Or are you thinking of Kingdom, Kingdom Come Deliverance? That's that, Yes, that's the one. And it's um, it's like, oh no, it's, it's, it's just historical accuracy, that's what it is. I think it was a response to um, complaints about like the cast, the, the characters in The Witcher being like uh, uniformly white. What is, is this like sort of what, press F to perform Prima Nocta or what? No, no, no. <laughs> it's not quite that bad. <laughs> Um, but I do, I like, I, I was actually just recently playing Kingdom Come Deliverance and, and I should say like, I'm friends with a number of people at, um, Warhorse and I have had dinner with Daniel Vavra many times. And every single time we have dinner, we argue about politics because he is maybe not completely opposite from me, but pretty far away. Um, but yeah, like Kingdom Come Deliverance is, it's set in rural Bohemia in the early 15th century and, um, you know, it was around the, t yeah, it was around the time. It, it was a sort of a knock on effect from Witcher three saying, Hey, why aren't there people of color really at all in the, in these games? And they're like, well, it's fantasy. Or, it's kind of Poland. It's kind of fantasy. <laughs> it's kind of fantasy Poland. And then in kingdom come deliverance, it is, um, you know, it is, it is, you know, sort of strictly history, but I guess here's the thing. Strictly history is also selective. Like you can say, we're only referencing history, and that can be a correct statement, but you choose what history to reference. And um, I think it's fair to say that when, you, when you're when you in rural Bohemia, black folk, thin on the ground. Um, but, you know, that that's a choice of where it was set. Um, and there, I mean, there are, there are other people, there are, there are Jews, there are, at a certain point, there are Romani that are in that area, probably not quite then, but like... Um, I think that it's a tricky balancing act because you can say something is purely historical, um, and and that's one. Of, honestly, Kingdom Come Deliverance is one of the most historically detailed games that I've ever played. But again, you choose what history you want to portray, and um, so I don't think that saying this is purely historical means that there's nothing to critique there. Like you still have to kind of engage with the choices you make about what you want to show and what you don't want to show. Yeah. 
but it did it did do incredibly it was incredibly popular with a specific subset of keep politics out of games crowd mm-hmm. which is hilarious yeah. because the whole game is about the struggle for the crown of bohemia the whole fucking game <laughs> like right away the game is about these two brothers fighting for the crown of bohemia so to say this is not political is obvious again it's like this is just a defined as the default state of the world and therefore not political, which is kind of silly, but <laughs> it's inherently political. I guess there's a there's a point in that, you know, even, like you said, the, the, the type of narrative you choose is a choice, you know, but also, like, non, non-narrative games, like we've talked about, we've talked about Civ, there's a lot to talk about with Minecraft and the villagers there, for example. You know, these are non-narrative games, but... They de- they definitely have commentary one way or the other. Like the fact that you kidnap villagers in Minecraft to put them in your own village and just like abuse them for resources and stuff is is pretty yikes. But let's talk about let's talk about a nice cheery subject: the Holocaust. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Now this was this was a point I admit I, I brought up in the show notes earlier. You wouldn't dream of setting in a World War II game saying we need to set out to simulate the Holocaust. Yeah, are, are you whitewashing history by doing that? Um, I mean, I don't think by just by um, excluding it, you're, you're strictly whitewashing history. But but again, that's that's a part of history that everyone, re- like or most people, really understand and or at least have, you know, a, 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 a good grasp of. Like every or most people know that the Germans committed a genocide and that that was a very bad thing. Obviously, there's a, there's a certain sort of minority of people who uh, it didn't happen, and if it did, it was good. But um, most people, Welcome. I think, yeah, I think most people, um, you, you don't need to bring that up in, in, in when you're discussing World War Two because everyone everyone is familiar with that as as a sort of part of the context. Um, but in other other instances, I mean, there's a lot of genocides where the the sort of average uh, the average person you speak to wouldn't even know that it happened, um, or would would be offended at the idea that that that, that was a gen. Do you know what I mean? Like, I I imagine there's a lot of Americans who would get um, incredibly annoyed if you like try to point out to them that their country was founded on on the genocide of the people who like lived there before them. Oh yeah. Uh, and um and that's so i think if you like like i said with sid meyer's colonization um that sort of white that definitely whitewashes the period because it doesn't sort of really focus on how terrible uh some of the atrocities were or that they happened at all um you know like the conquistadors sacking like the inca civilization is just it's it's a, a fun game mechanic you know what i mean it's, it's <laughs> Yeah. It's something you're expected to do if you play as Spain. And, and um, good times were had by all. Yeah, and you know you get lots of like uh, wagon trains full of gold for doing it, and it really sort of like sets you up for for the rest of the game. But um, if you made a game, if you make a game in World War Two that doesn't ref doesn't directly reference the Holocaust, I think people just you know uh, it's a it's a well enough established part of history. Um, that everyone just knows it's there. Whereas if you made a game that suggested it didn't happen or that it wasn't as wide, like the scale wasn't quite what people suggest, you know, any sort of the the, the, the basic tenets of uh, Holocaust denialism, then that's definitely whitewashing it. But I think something that well known just being omitted isn't strictly whitewashing. But again, I don't know that I would. I don't know that I would say that it's it's necessarily fine to omit it. But could you? I mean, <clears throat> in 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 that sort of vein, could you make uh, Call of Duty Vietnam? I mean, uh, yeah. not yet. No, I mean, I mean, yeah, you could. Like, I mean, well, I mean, Battle um, Dice already made Battlefield Vietnam, and there were other Vietnam games made. Um, like, there are certainly. I guess the thing is, like, so so I think one of the points is that a single game cannot hold the world entire. Like you can't, you, it's all a matter of focus. Like, like I said before, like whether you're showing Bohemia in 1403 or you're showing Vietnam in 1969, like what are you showing and what are you omitting? And what are you trying to communicate to people by what you show and what you omit? Um, And, 
to a certain extent, like if you don't, you know, if you don't deal with the Holocaust directly in World War II, holy shit, there's certainly so many other things going on that you could be, you know, sort of forgiven. So, for example, like, uh, obviously I'm jumping media here a bit, but like Foil's War, the series, I thought was a fascinating um, series just by the virtue of the idea, which is you have a civilian detective in the UK investigating crimes taking place during war, something that had not really been dealt with in, in at least any TV shows that I had seen. And so that was a new and interesting exploration of a period that we all feel we know <laughs> more, more or less. Um, but again, like when you're showing uh, something during the Vietnam War, are you are you showing the war? Are you showing um, the effect of war on civilians? Like you can look at something like this War of Mine, which obviously says we're not looking at this from the perspective of the people who are active combatants. We're looking at this from the perspective of the people who are just trying to live through this nightmare, civilians. Um, so you no game set in any time period in any place can really capture everything. So I do think it's worth asking, like, what are we trying to say? And the more sensitive that subject gets, like when we talk about whether it's the Holocaust or rape or all sorts of like terrible subjects, um, the more the more sensitive that subject is, the more careful you have to be and the more, I think, really consulting with other people and experts in that field you have to do. Um, because it, it's it's a minefield. And so I think that's why probably a lot of people just avoid it. I don't think they try to whitewash it, but they understand that it's very painful and difficult to deal with and that there are so many more ways to mishandle it than there are ways to handle it well. Yeah, yeah I should point out as well, when I said you couldn't do a uh, Call of Duty Vietnam, I mean specifically you probably wouldn't get away with doing a, a first-person shooter set during the Vietnam War in the, the sort of Call of Duty style where it's all very sort of like, oh, this is a just war, this is brilliant, we're, we're, really, we're the good guys, everything's sort of hoorah, and any atrocities were committed by the Russians, that sort of thing. Yeah. People would people would pull you up for that, but they definitely have made, they have made shooters set in, in Vietnam um, with varying sort of, varying levels of success, I would, I would feel. Yeah, sorry, sorry um, for misunderstanding your point. No, no, that's fine. I mean, I mean um, but I, Vietnam, Vietnam is a, 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 a weird war because it's, um, it, I don't think I've ever seen a film about Vietnam in the, that sort of, that wasn't about um, how it was a really bad idea and it fucked up all the soldiers involved. And I think that that perspective isn't a particularly great one um anyway because it's like yeah okay yeah it was it was an unjust war and it did like you know it did really fuck up all of the the soldiers involved but at the same time those soldiers were invading like you know they were from a, a much more powerful nation invading a much less powerful nation and so yeah it, it fucked up all the american soldiers um their, their experience in the jungle but at the same time to sort of focus exclusively on on how well, that war was terrible, look, look what it did to our boys, is a, a sort of really skewed view of it because you know it, it was probably wasn't it wasn't a, a great deal of fun for the other side either, was it? No. Well, fun fact: more bombs were dropped on Vietnam in the what in I think it was one year than were dropped on the entirety of Germany in six. <laughs> Jesus. I just remembered, by the way, that Robert McNamara was a, a playable character in in Call of Duty. <laughs> what? What? Yes. Yeah, there's um. There's like a because they have a. Uh, I can't remember when they entered. I think it was the first or second game that had the zombie horde mode. Um, and yeah, there's there's some uh one of those modes. It's not like during the the main story, but like there's a mode where one of your playable characters is Robert McNamara, and I was like, holy <laughs> shit, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I swear we're like five years off of George W. Bush having a cameo in one of the uh, Call of yeah, Duties it's... being introduced by Alan or whatever. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Uh, now imagining like a brand new video game where it's um, the Arrow Morris Robert McNamara interview and it's the, uh, you know, the Bart Simpson control of Bon Mo um, witty observation <laughs> trench in <laughs> question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... I, I I don't want to I don't want to put Activision on notes or anything, but they are running out of time to get a Henry Kissinger cam, uh, cameo on True. Call of Duties. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure now they can they can synthesize all that stuff from from existing footage, but but yeah, I mean I mean you don't you don't need to synthesize anything. It's just him <laughs> saying bombs are good. Let's bomb more yeah. places. 
Yeah, but I, I, I do think that, yeah, we, we sort of internalized, you know, and again, it's like, what do you want to say? Like, if people want to say war is bad, usually they're like, well, we can deal with Vietnam. But there, there are so many other sort of wars of imperialism or, or wars of, you know, like revanchist wars or things like that that happen that are like so messy that no one really is going to deal with them. Like, when's the last time you saw a game about the Boer Wars or like... Or like, you know, the, the, the post, post-World War II, you know, Yugoslav expanse into Austro-Hungary Hungary to reclaim, um, you know, like ethnically German areas. Like, you know, it's just so, you know, like narratively complicated that people, generally speaking, players like simple narratives. And even if there's nuance to it, like in Vietnam, we kind of have accepted that it's like, oh, that's the tragic, the tragic war. Kind of tragic for the Vietnamese, but really, when you think about it, <laughs> yes. it's really tragic for the Americans. Yeah, yeah. And but then they show some cuts of the music, and it's like, oh, it's actually not all bad. Yeah. Although most of that music <laughs> was very bad. Um, but the, but that is a sort of an interesting sort of point. Is it does it does it make it easier to to set these kinds of questions um, if if you just put them in in outer space or in, in your case, Josh, in a, in a fantasy narrative, um, does it just make it easier to sort of elide those issues? Because in, in, in a fantasy game, you can always say, well, why are we killing all the bog people? Well, the bog people are blood-worshipping, you know, space Satanists. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say yes and no. And again, I would say that I'm guilty in perpetuating a lot of this stuff. Um, so again, like what I said before is like, whether it's fall at new Vegas, like Raiders, you know, like we have Raiders and, and some of these Raiders are people that you talk to and others are just so goddamn fucking crazy and <laughs> they need drugs and they just want to kill you. Um, but in, in like pillars of eternity we have, and I tried to, I tried to make some nuance to it. So there is this idea of Kith and wilder and Kith are folk, which are humans, folk, Elves, um, Amawa, Orlans, Dwarves, and Godlike. And then there are also, although Godlike can also appear among Wilder, but then Wilder are like Zorips, which are kind of like little kobolds. Zorips, um, ogres, nagas, and things like that, that are clearly sapient. They clearly have their own culture. And really, they only live outside of Kith culture because Kith make the differentiation between Kith and Wilder. Um, they kind of say, like, you're not like us, you're too different from us, and you are apart from us. Um, and they set themselves up in this sort of hostile relationship. From a gameplay perspective, it does make it easy that 99% of the time when you encounter, um, you know, like a Zorip or an Ogre, you're pretty sure that they're going to be hostile toward you Um on site, but it does reinforce this us, you know, this sort of foreign other that is either incomprehensible or not really interested in the nuance of conversation. Um, we do have a few times where you are able, well, actually ogres, you can talk to quite quite a fair amount, but Zorips are one where they're almost always kind of alienated from you and hostile, um, which is, I admit, not great. Um, it is primarily done as a gameplay thing, but it does reinforce that idea of the the incomprehensible hostile other. Yeah, I, I, I can I? I was just going to say, I one thing I really did like playing through Deadfire was um, the uh, it is it is obviously um, I did note that it was it was there is that sort of element of us and them, um, the civilized and the less civilized. But I did I did really appreciate that um, the fauna were were kith do you know what i mean that the, the the dividing line between the civilized and the less civilized wasn't drawn there and also i really appreciated um the the fact that it's sort of like um the fact that it's sort of coded the you know well the the, uh, the kith are the 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 good like well not necessarily all good but they're, they're 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 more sort of you can converse with them and you you can't converse with the wilder it did make the the occasions where you can um like interact with the wilder like much more powerful i felt um when i played through as a sort of more diplomatic character i really appreciated the sort of that you can get a zour up on the on the ship's crew and you can there's bits where you can you sort of the there's bits where there'd be like a, a combat encounter in the wild but some of those combat encounters 
you can just sort of uh, like deal with diplomatically and, and avoid the fight. Um, and obviously the pirates, um, the pirates have a lot of like wilder kicking around with them, especially augurs. And I did sort of, I did appreciate that. I thought that was a, a, a nice bit of world building that like everyone considers the wilder to be less, but the pirates obviously don't sort of sign up to that. Yeah, it's um, um yeah there there was there's again some in, some intentionality there uh, again acknowledge not to say like we did a great job because again it does still reinforce some negative stuff but like with Zorips um a lot of it is presented as an obstacle that is um a little more intrinsic than purely just cultural like Zorips their mouths can't make a lot of the sounds that um that Kith can and so like literally talking speaking each other's languages are like incredibly difficult. Um, and uh, like Vithrak are very, very strange looking to Kith. And they're, um, they're, the way that their minds work is, and their society works is very alien. And so it's just, it's very hard for people to give them a fair shake, um, but they are incredibly intelligent if you do talk to them. Um, and so I tried to, whenever possible, show that these were problems between cultures, not intrinsic, like the Zorips are bad, or the Ogres are bad, or the Vithrak are bad, but more like there are physiological and sociological barriers to the interactions between these groups that then cause Kith nations and cultures to write them off. Um, and that leads to this very kind of shoot on site mentality between both groups. Um, but yeah, like, you know, even you know, again, like looking at our own cross cultural sort of contacts, when we look at seafaring and piracy, there's a lot of people from all over the world that wind up getting involved in, in the age of sail. And uh, obviously within the, um, within the pirates you have Kith, but then I was like, they wouldn't stop at Kith. They would, they would let anyone work with them that they felt would, would do a good job. Um, and so that's why you do get ogres and the occasional um, Bithrak or uh, Zorip in the mix. I worry sometimes with stuff like that, where, you know, you can, you have these like alien cultures and then you have essentially one of the good ones. Yeah. It's true. Um, I think for with the Zarip that can join in Dead Fire did a really good job because it's you no know, a, a very sympathetic moment. Uh, she's very obviously betrayed by her own tribe and sort of clings to you. And yeah, it's not that they're one of the good ones. It's just that shit happens and they're willing to go with you, and then you can you can still make the choice. Do you know what I mean? Um, whereas with the ogres, I thought it was a bit more sort of. Because they, you know, they they talk your language, but they're either wild or pirates, and, and maybe I missed that bit, but it's not super clear, sort of, if that's just because of that's how their society works, or if just the Kith were massive dicks to them, and so that's what they ended up doing, for example. Yeah, it's um, I think that we get got a little more in depth in it. And again, this is the pro this is a problem when you have like many species and many cultures and and it's fantasy on top of it so there's lots of stuff that you have to explain um i think pillars one i think we did a better job of showing ogre society and how it kind of works um but the general um the general trend is that ogres by their nature male ogres are quite um quite aggressive and suspicious um and solitary and they don't they really react poorly to people sort of infringing on their territory. And in their larger societies, their matriarchs um, tend to organize them and kind of like settle them down, so to, so to speak. Um, and uh, it largely was Kith that refused to respect, like, you know, and I guess you could view this as colonialism against one guy, but um, in a lot of cases, it's like, it's like one ogre, or a couple of ogres living on their own and settlers come through and they're like, well, we want, we want something in this cave or we want something in this area. We got to get that ogre out of there. And it's like, well, that ogre was there. <laughs> like that ogre was there before you got here. Like, what the fuck do you think you, but they were like, well, but they're violent and they're, you know, they're not trustworthy. So let's just wipe them out. But again, we did try to, at least in pillars, many of the ogres, especially in the white March, you can, um, 
diplomatically resolve things with the ogres. And usually what it turns out is it's not as simple. You almost always encounter kith first. And the kith say, oh my god, these ogres are so fucking crazy and violent. And they just like, they just want to kill all of us. And then you encounter the ogres and they're like, well, we are a little crazy and violent, but I, we didn't go out of our way to start shit with these people. These people came out here and started shit with us. And yeah, we smashed a bunch of them because they were fucking with us. Um, if you don't want that to happen, then I guess don't come in and try to murder us. Um, so again, I do think it's a very difficult um, line to walk. Uh, yeah. And yeah, I think we did an okay job, but I, you know, in the future, there's always room for improvement. Yeah. I think it's got interesting parallels with the uh, Juana where, you know, like you mentioned earlier, people sort of went, oh, oh, they're not perfect, so I guess I guess I like the Valians or the Rawatai now. Yeah. And with the ogres, that doesn't really happen. People are like, just like, oh, these ogres, I, don't know, I guess just kill them all. No, it's, just, it's also sort of genetic memories of all video games, essentially. It's just like, it's, yeah, it's, that's you know, true. the kill an ogre. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a murder horrible problem, basically, yeah. Problematico. <laughs> no, but I appreciate that at least, like, I think Pillars of Eternity and, and to sort of at least try to give an explanation for the things that, that you are doing, um, uh, whether it's like the the, the Rawatai and saying, no, just go out and kill the Druids because they're being really annoying, um, or the, the Ogres in, in Pillars of Eternity 1 where it's just like, okay, you know, you you can do these things, but there are reasons for them. And I remember, I can't remember when, but I think on occasion I just, I, I got, uh, you know, I won't say I got bored with the dialogue, but I was just, I'd had a lot of dialogues. So I was just like, right, I'm just going to press the kill all button now. And then afterwards, like, <laughs> you know, when I stood in a pile of corpses, I was a bit like, hmm, kind of feel bad now. Because I think there's probably like a backstory <laughs> that just <laughs> <laughs> kind of blew my way through. Which I think is, is quite an accomplishment, because I do think most modern video games are nowhere near that point of actually trying to assign that level of motives. Yeah, and I, I do think, you know, again, I, I do have to recognize that the more than the genre expectation, the expectation of games in the vein of Baldur's Gate and Icewind Dale, you're going to wind up murdering a lot of things. And so at their core, you know, it's like the reason why, going back to my Marvel Cinematic Universe thing, the reason why I don't really feel bad saying that the depth of the thematic depth is shallow is because there are so many genre conventions that have to be like adhered to for the enjoyment of the audience because that's that's why you that's why you consume genre fiction and media in the first place is because of the conventions but the conventions take up so much mental space <laughs> and narrative space in what you're doing that even if you try to deal with other big themes human themes it's hard to make space in your mind <laughs> within that. Um, I mean, that's the reason why so often genre fiction is kind of derided compared to literary fiction, because literary fiction is just purely dealing with whatever its themes are um, to the extent that it can. Genre fiction has the dual burden of carrying the load of the genre expectations as well as whatever thematic things it wants to explore. And sometimes the genres lend themselves well to it, and sometimes they don't. But in any case, um, going back to the point asked 30 minutes ago when you asked the question, <laughs> um, going, going into space or going into fantasy land in some ways makes it easier to talk about certain thematic things, but it is tricky. And I feel like, I feel like honestly, when I, when I hear things like David, David Cage kind of saying both ways, like, well, this is not really about like apartheid. This is not really about like African American experience in the real world. But then also clearly it is directly lifting like oblique references to civil rights movement in the United States. I don't think you can have that both ways and say like, well, this isn't really this, but let me just directly lift a reference and change one word. I mean, that's the reason why people got pissed off with the Augs Life Matter things. It's like, motherfucker, like you cannot just co-opt that <laughs> and pretend like you didn't do that. Um, so yeah, like uh, it is easier for us to have fantasy, you know, like to have the Royal Dead Fire Company. And I will say that we we put a lot of effort into not making them direct analogs. Like there was a time where the Royal Deadfire Company, it really felt like Imperial Japan, like really, really, really felt like Imperial Japan. 
and we stepped back and said, like, hold on, like, this is not Imperial Japan. This is a fantasy group. And if we, again, if we lift too directly, it's going to, it's going to mix messages and, and, and feel off. So I do think you have to be very, very careful. It is easier in some ways, but it is also very easy to step on a landmine and really piss a lot of people off or miss your message. You miscommunicate something. And I mean, I, you, like you bring up David Cage there, and I think the, the game directly quotes from Martin Luther King Jr. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Point. But yeah, it, it, it brings to mind um, Ubisoft saying things like the division is, is not political. Or the division, the, the division two, I think, where it's like the, the game is basically about how um, when society collapses, owning a gun will have, will save you. Yeah, <laughs> but it's, it's not. It's not there's no politics. Yeah, involved. and I I, I I should qualify that Terry Spear, who is the creative director on that, used to be my roommate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when uh, I mean, when we were yeah when and he's a friend of mine when we uh yeah when we were very early in the industry we we lived together in Irvine back in the early two thousands. But um, but yeah, and I I do think again there's this kind of um, you know there's this idea that certain things can can be apolitical, and it's really only if you don't want to dig deep into it. But again, like I feel for for many people, things like gun ownership or you know like the realities of of sort of a post uh, you know like uh, not, I don't want to say an anarchic society, but one where basically paramilitary groups are calling the shots like okay like there's obviously that's a that's a different political reality than we live in now that's not apolitical um i can certainly understand devs saying we don't want to focus on these aspects of that thing but i do think ultimately like 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 i mean someone said it at the very beginning of the thing like every everything actually is political it's kind of the the depth to which you want to explore or address those things and whether that is that is on the surface and it is the main a main theme and it is the main text or if it is um substrata you know it's subtext it's nuance and it's not the core player maybe doesn't engage with these things but they're there um and so i i can i can see a place for those things but i i do think that it is either i don't really believe that those people are being disingenuous i think that they're not grappling and really coming to terms with the fact that for many people, maybe not for them, but for many people, these are very real political issues that affect them. And it goes back to that idea of you are apolitical if the status quo um, it supports you okay. and, and you don't have to think about it. Um, but the minute that you yeah. do, then it's political. Yeah, Ubisoft keeps saying, like, they, they keep saying that the games are, are apolitical and it's always about the most political like games, like um, obviously The Division. <laughs> Far Cry Five is apolitical, um, yeah. and, and the, the upcoming Watch Dogs set in a post-Brexit Britain. Yeah, it's, uh, um, my favorite bit of the the Ubisoft sandbox is at the beginning. Uh, I don't know if they do in all of them. I haven't played all of them, but I have played all the Assassin's Creed to my undying shame. Um, and they always say like, uh, "This game was made by a, a multicultural group of developers of various different faiths and religions." Now go forth and stabby stabby, and it's just like what? <laughs> I I want to say that start that became a thing at the start of games. Hitman does it too. Re- yeah, I, I want to say it became a thing in response to a specific incident. I think it was AC One. It might have. Been. I think it was Assassin's Creed One because, well, because they're dealing with Islam and they're dealing with Templars and Hashashin and 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 it. And the developers are all French Canadians, bless them. But like, <laughs> I, I, I've, I've got the idea in my mind that there was some game had um, like a terrorist act committed by Sikhs. Like they'd use Sikhs as just oh, a sort of generic stand-in, which is for, absurd. For... But yeah, I think I think yeah. you're right. But the first time that I and saw that disclaimer was AC One. Personally, it's, a, it's like the Temple of Doom disclaimer. It's like, no, they're actually really nice people. Mola Ram is also a cool guy. <laughs> <laughs> They'd been aware. They'd been aware of the fact that they pro- they might get into hot water by representing um, Islamic terrorism in the in the wake of nine eleven, and so they'd just sort of like gone. We'll put Sikhs instead, <laughs> and, and getting themselves into even worse yes. trouble. You know those Sikhs, um, yeah. But yeah, um, the, the, the thing the thing as well is, um, I think if anyone ever set out to make a genuinely apolitical game. That in itself would probably be a political statement. Yeah, it would also be terrible. 
I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know. You could say probably of some like platformers or something like that. Yeah, something I, super I, abstract, like I incredibly mean, abstract. Well, Pac Man is making a statement that drugs are good. <laughs> you eat you eat you eat drugs and then you're able to turn on the ghosts that have haunted you. I mean, I was going to make your entire, entire that, life. Maybe the biggest non-political game series is probably Mario, but then you, like, you have the whole princess bit. But then I think the princess is more abstract. Like I don't think there is maybe in like Paper Mario, but I've never played. But in, like the big platformers, there's essentially no politics, or or, or is that? Or, or, or is Mario sort of the, the colonialist, uh, you know, overthrowing the Cooper Empire to, to get their stars? It's it's Italian supremacy. It's an Italian supremacist game. What are you talking about? <laughs> you said, you get to, but then you get to shit like, oh, Sonic's just like a platform, but has like really, really weird, rich lore about how the world operates. Yeah, but yeah. the Sonic community, like, I'm not touching that with a barge ball because, like, there's some stuff that goes on in there that, like, I don't even want to know about. <laughs> I think I think ultimately, like whether it's you know whether it's the, the division or Kingdom Come Deliverance or whatever, I, I feel like there's uh, you know I think that a lot of the grief would just go away if they like you know to say this is a this is a game that deals with politics and political issues um, in different ways and and thinking about the nuance of that, I think what people what they're afraid of is that. When they, if they admit that something is is quote political or has politics in it, then they believe, and I'm projecting a little bit here, but like they believe that the audience is going to assume that they are, that it's propaganda. Yeah. And so when they say this is not political, really what they're trying to tell the audience is this game does not push a political position, which they might believe, and they're probably wrong implicitly <laughs> but that i think is probably what they're doing and usually i think again what it would be better is like i would not be i would not obviously it would be ridiculous to say dead fire is not a political game the politics of dead fire are fairly far removed from most people's lives and reality because if it is emulating anything it is emulating 16th to 18th century colonialism in our world um, which to a lot of people is something they just know very little about. Um, but also, again, I, for example, like I, I chose to make the Juana aspects of the Juana culture unsympathetic. I chose to make the Valians somewhat sympathetic in that they are not culturally cultural imperialists. These are all choices that I made, and I'm not in doing those saying. I believe that you should pick one of these. That's the whole point is to give you a range of options. Yeah. But again, I am the author and everything that goes in there is my choice. I constructed these cultures out of nothing. Well, not nothing, but inspired by real world things. But everything I chose to include or exclude was my choice. And so I can say that it's political and I can even say that I'm not advocating any particular thing but it it is very it would be very silly and i think it is often very silly when developers say this is not a political game and i think they would be better off turning their eyes inward and just recognizing that m most things are political and it is about i think representing them fairly and with an with a like a clear mind about what you're doing and not kind of brushing it off to the side and pretending like it doesn't exist yeah I think it's at some point they've got to pull off the band-aid, right? Like you can't just keep babying the, the players and and say no, no, this this isn't political. You won't have well, to. Well, a lot of the audience <laughs> does seem to be made up of very big babies. So. Yeah, but I mean, like you know, eventually you're gonna have to you're gonna have to break it to to, to those people that <laughs> actually they're gonna have to think about like how the world works. Oh. And so you might as well just do that sooner ah. rather than later. Right? Actually, it is about colonialism and, in video games. <laughs> yeah. but i mean like that you know again just because i think it is a good analog for just mainstream thinking you know like marvel cinematic universe um you know for as you know genre you know like genre sort of laced as it is um they even got kickback from like captain marvel like oh my god this is feminist bullshit and um so so many things about about that that are Again, you you have to be somewhat political. Or Captain America, even though 
holy shit, why don't you fucking read Captain America and see how political that he gets at times. Yeah. But like, you know, it's you have this mainstream audience that is kind of like huffing and puffing about politics being present at all. But again, it's not that politics aren't present. It's just that it's not the dominant, in their mind, the dominant discourse, which is that the way that things have been is apolitical and anything that deviates from that immediately becomes political. Yeah, I mean, I remember the um, the the uh, the round of like roar and dipshits on Twitter, like when Black Panther came out, just furiously tweeting about how like Wakanda isn't real, like some kind of security blanket. Do you know wait, what I mean? What? Yeah. Like, was, like, wait, <laughs> check what? it out. Asgard is also not real. I don't know if anyone told you yeah, that, but yeah, that that strangely didn't come up. But no, when Black Panther was coming out, there was like. I, I, and I say raw and dipshits. I mean Ben Shapiro and people of that sure. were, were doing tweets about, um, you know, what kind of hashtag Wakanda isn't real because they were just even even the suggestion that like a, a black civilization could like develop a superior technology was just terrifying to them, and so they had to constantly like on the hour remind themselves that it was just fictional. It was yes. it was surreal, and I mean, and Black Panther for all that people say, oh, it was, it was really good, and it brought up like issues of colonialism and everything. It still had a CIA agent as one of the good. Yeah, guys. of course. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> no, I, th- I mean, I think as we established in our uh, in our Marvel episode, that uh, Killmonger is the only correct person in that movie. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. But but I mean, I guess I mean you know, and and I will give a lot of shit because I those movies kind of kind of just destroy my brain other other than ant-man but um my fave but uh i do feel like um you know like they did they did cross thresholds that a big group of like you know people were complaining about but they're like well take it or leave it and for the most part the world said we'll take it so you know like for all the again with games like i think if you just said like yep there's politics in this game and we try to be fair and reasonable about how we portray them, and we hope that there's some nuance there, take it or leave it. And yeah, there are going to be people who say, like, I don't like it. I'm never buying this shit again, just like with every other fucking game that comes out. And like, okay, that's fine. Like, But I, I, I do believe that constantly kind of nervously digging in your heels and going like, no, there's no politics. Please, like, please play yeah, the game. Yeah, come back, come back. <laughs> like, it, it, it's okay. I, and I, I do think that you can, I do, again, believe that you can say, there are politics in this game without like getting up on a soapbox and stamping your foot and saying like, I believe in, yeah. you know, neoliberalism and I'm going to tell you why it's great. It's like, dude, there's, there's a, a broader spectrum between apolitical and political than either not doing anything or taking a very specific, uh, full throated endorsement stand on something. Yeah, please, please don't put Joe Biden in video games. <laughs> no, that would be amazing. You could do an amazing, like, sort of indie game where you just explore his dying mind, you know, with with the with the ghost of Jesse Helms and the racist crew or something. That'd be like psych. No, psych- we'll put him psych- in Call of Duty. Jo- yeah, Joe Biden in yeah. Call of Duty win. <laughs> <laughs> they should go back and redo the one with Kevin Spacey and just, re- just digitally replace him with, with uh, Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we managed to get some jokes in at the end. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, anyone have any final thoughts to wrap this up? Gaming is a land of contrast. <laughs> it is. I, I do think, yeah, I do think that um, the more challenging spaces are ones where, and potentially more interesting, are the ones where there's there's a lunar narrative connection. So I when when you look at something like Papers Please or Civilization, I think that's where you see the strong contrast of like you're directly in, you're directly involved in the mechanics of colonialism um or nationalism or or fascism. And I think that those are the places where you're probably more likely to get insightful um progress. I think that when when the narrative and I'm going to, you know, say in Pillars or Dead Fire again because of the genre conventions of of uh you know real time with pause combat oriented role playing game it's more it more becomes well here are the mechanics on one side and then on the other side you have the narrative and in those cases it becomes a little more difficult i do believe that again unsurprisingly um you know we see a lot more interesting stuff happening in purely narrative games or 
you know, almost purely narrative games where the theme is really the meat of the content that the player is using their, you know, mind to explore. Um, but that said, you know, I think people have brought up a lot of good examples of places where whether the devs are willing to admit it or not, politics are in video games and, and topics of colonialism and post-colonialism are already in video games. They're just not engaging with it in an yeah. open fashion. Yeah, and I, I, I would say fine. I mean, I, I give people a lot. I give the oh, keep politics out of games crowd a lot of shit. But if anyone, if anyone's listening to this and they've made it this far through and and they are of the sort of mindset that politics should be kept out of games, I would say to them just you know, it, it, just take that first step and just embrace it. It's not that scary. All right, great. Well, thanks for coming on. Yeah, Josh. thank you. Thank you for it. Thank you for having me. It was great. And, and thank you, all of you, for not spoiling uh, the ending for Pillars uh, for Deadfire yet. <laughs> well, play faster. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, great. Thanks for listening, everyone. And um, we'll be back soon with another cultural episode for you to uh, Yeah, that's a, a get decidedly into. different one, I think. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> all right. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank you.